Um, hi, this is the usual spiel I give to everybody every time because there's some new people every time. Uh, Coffee Compiler Club, anything fair game to do with compilers, language runtimes, GC, code gen, language design, stuff like that. Um, open mic. I ask that you mute if you're not talking so that we don't get any background noise, but I don't care other than that. Um, I, I reserve the right to moderate, never had to do it. Uh, that's it. Everyone else has heard this spiel so many times. I'm not sure why I'm doing it. Oh, I record all this and it goes up on YouTube videos. So if you don't want your kid on YouTube video, let me know and I'll cut the front end off, but I'm recording now. And here she is poking her face in. So she's, <laughs> Karen's jumping up and down. Oh, yeah, see, we get her going here. <laughs> uh-huh. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, no. Okay, fine. Yeah, I'm a grandfather now, so. <laughs> but my baby's in, in Philadelphia, damn it. Yeah, and I'm actually done with video, so now I can drop the the photographic backdrop that's behind my head now. And you can go, by, go back to seeing my you know, exercise ball and my big screen Xbox game. There it is. So um, any particular topics here? I know I've been talking with chat with Zen about C2IR, which turns into how do you describe a graph-based IR when you're doing development debugging? And I have a bit of advice for him and he's not here, which that mostly I tried it a number of times and a bunch of people tried it and it never worked for me except theoretically understanding the high level concepts, but in actual production use, I use very fancy pretty printers. My debuggers are always very fancy pretty printers. Well, and, I'll, uh, second, I'll second that. Yeah. Okay, fine. And one I've of the joys, of using Emacs as your debugging IDE is that the pretty printing goes into the Emacs buffers where you can immediately search, paste, cut, all that kind of stuff, run macros on giant volumes of output. Yeah, that makes sense. But there, for C2 in particular, there's also a, a visualization tool. That's what we're talking that. about. I, I have never found the visualization tool useful in production debugging. Okay. And I have talked to lots of people who have played with them, and I don't know of anybody who's using it except to understand what the graph, how the graph semantics are represented. Once they get the semantics down, it's a cute toy, but it doesn't help you. Somehow it's not fast and efficient enough to transliterate the ideas of what's going on over fancy compiler pretty printers. Well, I guess the problem is that real world graphs are too large to, to visualize and navigate through them visually. Yeah, it's hard to navigate. So I dump yeah. it into a text buffer and now my navigation's, you know, control S and type some characters for search and whatever. It's very, very quick. Yep. When I have 10 nodes, 20 nodes, it's nice for semantics to sort of play out. When I have 10,000 nodes, no good. Yeah, makes sense. I've, I've, I've found the same. There's just too much stuff. And especially the current tool, it doesn't allow you to drag around nodes. Mm -hmm. So you can't arrange them the way you want yourself. It just puts them on the screen somewhere for you, uh, which is kind of annoying as well. I had a tool myself, but I, not the one that's currently out there, that lets you drag and drop and move the, the graphs around. Most I did it because I was exploring how to write graphics libraries back when they were brand new and people didn't you know, know what the hell they were doing, right? And uh, that was with much fiddling and arranging, you could get these views that were very emblematic. They were poster child perfect, but they were too slow to go put together. Well, here's Zen now. Um, he's been, been working on the same issue. Hey Zen, oh, you're still connecting. There you are. So a bit of advice was that the, the graphics things are great for understanding the semantics in a high level, but on a day-to-day -day use, I always use uh, command line style, not command line, I, you know, pretty printers called from a debugger. Um, and mine all do, um, I have both indenting, you used to talk about you were adding indenting. I have both indenting and non-indenting versions. 
because the indenting versions are great if they show good high level structure until you have too many and then they, they have the standard, you know, JavaScript pyramid of doom that just indent off the screen and then back on, it doesn't help. But for small counts of things where smalls and hundreds indenting is fine. But when I do a big dump, I don't indent flat. Okay. There's, also this, uh, there's also this other tool. I know we were talking a while ago about how Elm allows you to debug backwards. There's also yeah. a tool called RR that is basically GDB, but it it allows you to record an execution of a program and then run it in GDB and you can step backwards as well. So you get so you would run it and hit a crash, run it into the debugger, hit the crash again, and then you can inspect the state and set watch points on how, which how, is no input uh, arrays. Right. How far, how fast backwards does it go? I've seen time travel debugging for a long time, uh, but it never really hit production. Like an Elm, it kind of kind of was useful up to a point. It's very slow because of the recording going forward. Very convenient when you go backwards. So I ask you, yeah, what's the what's the what's the roll forward, roll backwards overhead? Um, I've not used it myself yet, but I've seen a demo and it seems pretty fast, like a few seconds to step backwards. It's, it it seems just as fast as a normal debugger, to be honest. But yeah, what's what's the speed to go forwards? Because you have to record. I didn't see any difference in the demo. It was just yeah. 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 You run a oh here's somebody throwing in the chat already. It's yeah, I've thrown in the link there. Ah, there you go. Okay. I, I'm my current development machine is Windows, so I have to. This is Linux only, so I have to uh, switch over to try this out sometime mess around. Yes, I've gone back and forth in Windows and I do gaming on Windows and Linux was most of my business stuff and I go back and forth. Um, and they record and I don't say what the recording overhead, which would be really slick if it has a low enough overhead. Um, they're claiming it's working regularly by developers inside and outside of Mozilla. There you go, 20% slowdown. That is very, that is very tolerable. Okay, this is a huge difference. A decade ago, the overheads were 10X. 20% is entirely tolerable. Okay, that is really good to know. Da -da -da -da. Okay, somebody else has to say something. Or it's not a conversation. <laughs> Bringing up topics of some kind or another, I don't know what. And I've been wanting to ask a few weeks ago if anybody knows about um, projects that are using JNI criticals. So you have these critical native functions. Um, for JNI, there was supposed to be a JDK internal only API, but it wasn't protected, so it might be used in the wild. Um, and now we're there thinking of removing it. Um, but of course, that will break code that was depending on it, anyways. Uh, I don't know if anybody using that or knows a project that's used that. I don't. Do you know what it is? I know what it is. I implemented one side of it. Okay. I mean, I was part of the implementation. I didn't, eh, I screwed around with that piece. Um, especially at Azul, I had to redo all the JNI wrappers. What yeah. is the, what's, what's the criticals? Yeah, what's sure. that? Yeah, okay. So basically, when you do a normal native call, it does a thread state transition. So in case you want to do an op calls, it saves some thread local state. And then when you come back, it does a safe point poll and maybe some other bookkeeping. It does a stack regard, for instance. Um, and for the, there was a crypt, crypto, cryptography library that wanted to make these calls faster. So basically, they said, if you have a JNI critical native, we don't do the thread state transition all. So you, you can't go back into Java. And if you get a stack overflow exception, you crash and stuff like that. And you can't uh, do a GC cycle. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you can pass a Java array in. And it gets split up into a pointer to the data and the length. 
And during the call, GC is locked. So you can do your work without having to copy out the array uh, and then come back to Java basically without having this extra overhead for doing a native call. I totally remember this. Yeah, if I had known about it, we would have used it. <laughs> well, it, it has the issue that you block GC. So why are you using Java in the first place? Right, you're just saying no to GC. You're not always, but while your critical's running, there is no GC. Um, and, yeah. and, and in fact, there's no other thread transitions possible. So you block like class loading. You block yeah, it's, a bunch it's, for, of stuff. it's for small native co calls maybe that you want to do with CPU specific instructions. Right. Uh, so I think so it was the particular case. Video codecs, audio codecs, we're doing it. Um, they had to have, you know, basically short duration guarantees because you would lock the, the JVM up pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Waiting for the you to basically you took a you took a critical interlock. You know, it's Python global interpreter lock. You took the kill in Java, and you held on to it while you're doing your shit. That that yeah. was kind of the flavor. Yeah, it seems there are some reasonable if you're writing a JVM. I'm sorry, it seems pretty reasonable. Seems perfectly reasonable if you're writing a JVM. To take a take a gill. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. What I'm saying is, if, yeah, yeah. if if you're the one writing the JVM, yeah, it's not good if you're the one writing the library that plugs in. Right. I, I, think, right. I think there's a JNI API that supports it as well because you can get you, there's like get array elements and that there's get array elements critical, which I assume does the same. I haven't looked at it, this in depth. People went back and forth like we could do we could allow GC, but we'll pin this array. So this array won't move. And if it's yeah, array right. of primitive data because it's an audio video codec, um, that's fine, except the GCs all hated pinned arrays. They had to ask on every object out of the billion in your heap, are you pinned? Of which exactly one was pinned. So it felt like a giant waste of time and slowed down GC cycles. So the GC Yeah, but that's also why they created the um that's why Mark added the uh, uh, direct uh, byte direct buffer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get away from get away from pinned arrays. So, Jorn, is your question whether or not anyone's using it so it can be safely gotten rid of? Yeah, basically that. Well, yeah, it's an unsupported API, so I don't think there's much in the minds of the people trying to move move this from stopping them from doing that. But uh, if anybody's moving it, we have somewhat of a migration path in mind. Um, so yeah, just just curious if everybody's moving that, you know, are, are we gonna break the whole Java ecosystem by removing these critical Yeah, and... I mean, my suggestion is, is in the next patch, <laughs> you add a, uh, a system error message the first yeah. time someone hits it and, you know, say, you know, this is unsupported, please, you know, please, please send an email to blah, 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 to let us know you're using it. Yeah. But I'd, I'd get rid of it as soon as possible. I mean, yeah, deprecate, but, deprecate, warn, and then remove. It's a nightmare. Ba ba basically, yeah, yeah. Basically, the, um, the code that does the native wrapper generation. So when you have a native call, basically, a, na a native method in Java has a Java method that's underneath it. But it's basically a wrapper that does the actual call to the native function and does the thread state transition. Basically, the code for that is just a bunch of if statements for if we're doing critical natives, do this and all else do that. And that's pretty much a nightmare. So I, I get why they're trying to get rid of this. The other thing about calling natives that are not critical is that the overheads are kind of shockingly high. Um, there's an argument shuffle and there's a stack lock and there's a handleizing of all objects, uh, yeah. pointers. And the sum of all those things, even on x86 is like 50 to 100 clock cycles. So if your native is doing something less than that, which if you're using custom x86 instructions to do byte reversal in a buffer, um, yeah, it, it can be more overhead making the call than doing the native and you want to have a cheaper call. Yeah, well, I, I'd suggest in that case, you don't probably don't want to call at all. You just want to add an intrinsic 
somewhere to do that for you, right? This is if you're right. So, so if you're not able to build the JVM and add intrinsics, but you can write C code and you want to do a native call, this is your normal path forward. That was yeah. the expectation that when I was back in the day, the normal path was everyone else wrote C because there was no JVM. Okay, so the people who wrote C code, what do they do? They did native call, they wrote C code, they didn't write a new intrinsic. Yeah. I hear you, the, 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 the low overhead things would be, I want an intrinsic that JIT's code in the JVM's managed state understands oops as part of the intrinsic so that we could have it just be C2 inline code. Same as C2 inlines the guts of TAN and CAS and crap like that. He, he understands where the pointers go and he just inlines and does the register allocation and he's done. Yeah. Uh, Vladimir Ivanov, one of the uh, compiler engineers working at Oracle as well, he did a prototype a few years ago which basically does exactly that. Uh, it was called machine code snippet. So you could provide a template for machine code and then uh, JIT would inline it for you. And you could even hook into the register allocator. So in the snippet, you would have certain placeholders for certain registers. Uh, and then the register allocator would fill that in for you. Sounds like the right way to go. As long as, long as you have to you have, to have some way to hook the oops too. Which if your machine code doesn't have any pointer oop issues, or you name all the oops up front, you can't make new oops secretly. Which is fine. Yeah. You pointer chasing games, do them all outside of your snippet and have all the pointers available to the snippet. And then they're all available to the register allocator so he can label the label things right. Yeah, that sounds like the right answer. Uh, this was um, originally done as an experiment for uh, supporting more vector instructions. Or oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. They switched later on to using an API that was intrinsified underneath. Oh, did they? Because they have were C2, C2 SSE short vector instructions not even that long ago. And they were directly emitting C2 vectorize ops, which turned into x86 SSE ops. Yeah, yeah. That, that, they, I think they were doing it for, for loops, unrolled loops. They would vectorize some of the operations. Yeah. But this is basically, you have a Java API and you know it's gonna turn into a vector instruction. That was the idea behind it. I think Intel, okay. a bunch of Intel people were working on this for a long time. It, uh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've seen Intel do this with all their compilers. They make sure there is an intrinsic at the C level that turns into the funny weird instruction. Yeah. Exactly one, exactly just this instruction. And then you can go write assembly code in C to go do your inner codex for whatever crypto and video and the like. It's basically the same, I think. Yeah, it makes sense. Fine, right. But yeah. getting, getting back to the overhead of native calls, I think one of the patterns that is problematic when you have some call overhead, uh, like if you're, if you're doing a native call and there's a large matrix multiplication that takes multiple milliseconds, then the overhead of a single call is not gonna matter much. I think it really starts adding up if you have a pattern where you have a wrapper class for a, an off heap struct or native struct and you save as one of the fields a long, which is actually a pointer to the struct. And then you have getters that do a native call, get some value from the pointer and then return that back to Java because for every memory access, for every off heap memory access, you have to do a native call. Uh, and for Panama, we're sidestepping that completely by adding an off heap memory API. Is it you like could... what unsafe is for directly? <laughs> you said this last time as well, yeah. But unsafe is. There's no such thing internal. as unsafe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so where. Exist. I hear you, except that not only do I use it all the time, I know a lot of people who use it all the time. So here's, oh. here's the other thing it, it's, it's so eerily similar to what we have with the, uh, the memory model when we're doing say CUDA or something like that, right? So you've got, you've got RAM on your, on your processor bus, and then you've got, uh, you know, VRAM sitting on your, your video card, right? And it's like, what's more efficient? Do I work with the, 
data in memory and then transfer it all over to the video card and then work with it there and then transfer it back? Or is it better to leave it in main memory, let the video card work on it there over the PCIe bus? Or is it better to store it all on the video card and manage it over the PCI bus from your, say your C code or something like that. So it's like, we're, you know, so what's the cost of copy versus the cops cost of individual access to the video card versus the cost of individual access from the video card into main memory. Like you've got all these trade-offs and it, and it, it usually comes down to, you know, how many operations of each are occurring times latency compared to the other choices. Well, and the the difficulty of engineering a remote execution, if you're going to execute on the video card, you have to emit code. So you have to have a whole different code gen stack that right. you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was talking about just using unsafe. I hear you. Oh, there's no unsafe. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> For a long time, there was sun misc unsafe, which is what you did to get a CAS. Yeah. And then there was unsafe, which was a little more official. And then there was atomics, which are totally built on unsafe. Um, isn't isn't unsafe gone gone now? Since what? Java? I, I hear you. Well, I'm still using it on a daily basis. High scale lib, non blocking hash map, totally uses unsafe. Um, and if I googled last time, I googled around for unsafe based APIs. There were plenty floating around for the same. How do you way. access it in, in modern JVMs though? Or is there a command line switch to bring it back? Command line, there's a command line switch. There oh, shouldn't be. It should be It should be an open accessible module. It's JDK unsupported, I believe. But it should be. It, you shouldn't need to use reflection. Well, if you want to access unsafe, you need reflection. But you don't need to export the module explicitly. Yeah. Or you shouldn't yeah. be. As far as I know, it's still totally available. Yeah. And, and in fact, it has some behaviors that are not available any other way. So, Such as casing, you mean? Uh, yeah, not just cas, but cas without the overhead of a guaranteed extra indirection layer. Like the atomic boolean, atomic int, that kind of crap, those guys have an extra indirection layer, which yeah. is, in fact, the overhead that has to be dodged when doing crap like non-blocking hash map. Well, there, there is the var handle API, which basically removes the overhead. You can do a cas on a plain field with that right. as well. So I'm using... But unsafe to do CAS on a playing field. And then I don't have to learn how to do bar handles or change my code that's been out in the wild for 15, 20 years and working fine still. So you know, kill all the instances of people using non-blocking hash map. You wanna kill unsafe, you kill everyone using non-blocking hash map, which there are hundreds of thousands of downloads and some big name companies are using it directly in their code. So it can be rewritten, obviously. Um, it should and be just as fast. In theory, you have to go through and verify that the, everything cleans out and optimize it as all right things. And then do that for every other person, not just non-blocking hash map, who's using, was using unsafe for a very long time. Like I said, even when the atomics came out, they did not have the same behaviors and they did not have the same, both cost structures and actually you couldn't, for the longest time, you couldn't cast elements of an array. So, you know, it's been a long time since we've, whatever, the, the stuff's been out for a long time, doing all the right things. Why do we want to get rid of it? And what is VAR handles useful for? Why? That, that's the better question. Why would we care to change? I don't get it. Yeah, I, I think the main thing is that we, when you use unsafe, you have to pass in the field offset every time. And with VAR handles, basically you create the file where that's baked in. And it also does the right reflection and uh, right. language it's, access it's a, checking. It's a one-liner. You can go to the top of non-blocking hash map. I make a one-line call to go get the offset. And then I have a one-line function that does the CAS for that field. And then I call that. I, it, I imagine that the fundamental difference is with bar handles, you can't seg fault to JVM. Yeah, you can only, for fields, you can only access the real field. You can't just corrupt the object header because you screwed up somewhere. Right. Yeah, I, I get that. No, no, unsafe is unsafe. Fine. And so maybe there's a little more security checks on in bar handles. But like I said, seems like a lot of a lot of extra overhead and code rewriting for not a lot of gain, considering as soon as you reach for unsafe, you've already agreed that you're, you know, being careful or you're being dead. 
Well, unless you're a JVM developer, which has bugs from customers, which have some crashes, and then after you investigate, you find, well, they're using unsafe incorrectly. So I, I can see the value of providing a safer interface um, because, yeah, people shoot their feet all the time. With it. I agree. Never... I think the main motivation is for JDK developers as well. Um, yeah. And there's more than one use case for Java. I mean, you you have you have situations in which the JVM is running more than more than one thing. In which case, you know, blowing up the JVM is not. I mean, Cliff, your your statement basically says it's perfectly fine if I blow up the JVM. Well, yes, it is if it's running on your PC at home. Who cares, right? But if it's you know if it's running your software and someone else's software at the same time, then a, you know segfault is not an acceptable error handling approach. Yeah. And segfault is the good case, right? The bad case is exactly. you corrupt memory and you, no, the bad case I don't is know, you maybe you send, hole. what, you have sorry? A hole and you stole somebody else's stuff. <laughs> that's the bad case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what Intel is for. I mean, the JVM shouldn't be helping you do that. So, so I'm looking at the code in, in non-blocking hash map and it's all like one to two lines, depending on how you count. Uh, to go get the field offsets. And I'm not doing arbitrary math, except I'm doing from the from the field offset, from field names. So if our handle says I can only do offsets based on fields, I, I still need to do it on arrays um, and array offsets, for which I'm still willing to pay the overhead of a length check, but I still want to do a CAS on array elements. That you can do that with unsafe right now you mean you can do you can do unsafe array element cases now i'm buying hash maps been doing it for years but i'm not alone but other people do this too so I, I assume var handles would let you do updates on arrays i think atomic now lets you also do array updates it didn't for the longest time Var, I know var handle support it. You can get an, what's called an array access var handle, and then you pass in um, as an extra coordinate the index. Yeah. Uh, and then and, you, and then, then you want to do a CAS, right? Yeah. And and now that all has to fold away, which maybe it does, down to the raw instructions, same as unsafe does. Yeah, it and calls then, un, unsafe underneath. Um, you do end up going through the, the method handle machinery. So you right. have to make sure your var handle itself is a constant. And you make you have to make sure that you call it with the exact signature that it expects. Um, because otherwise it won't optimize. All right, fine. I'll, I'll claim that, you know, not blogging hash map doesn't have those issues, but maybe fine. I guess maybe non-blocking hash map is a well-behaved user. Right, right. And there's a weird there, thing what, with an update. What people said was, I guess Arthur just said, yeah, we have clients who are not well-behaved users and then things choke and die. I have a couple other uses for, for unsafe, which would be um, misaligned uh, loads um, for raw data for big data. H2O does misaligned loads on purpose. And we, we went back and forth on the, I'm an ARM chip, I'm not an ARM chip, and I don't care anymore. So that was- Does, uh, does ARM do that in software still? Or is I have it, no idea. Because Spark did, which was the most amazing thing. You, you know, you do a misaligned load and it, and it goes into user mode to do it. Do it thing, yeah. Azul kind of went down the same path. We, we went back and forth on this. The overhead of a user mode trap was just a couple of clock cycles at like flush. It was a mispredicted branch overhead on a short pipe. Then you were in a user mode trap handler for which the misaligned load ops were available, which would basically, you did two parts of loads with a shift that you threw in a secret hardware register, basically that he would accumulate the bits and then you could return. So it was like a dozen clocks on a slower clock cycle machine. So you can imagine an x86 taking 20 or 30 clocks would for equivalent behaviors for a misaligned load. 
Now, is that better or worse than doing a software misaligned load? It's probably worse, but not necessarily hugely. I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't a common, well, it was kind of common. What we did is we did these compression things. And if you decompressed and one, of the, one or more of the compression strategies, the optimal decompressed path said misaligned load, the payload because other things cause the payload to be shuffled. You know, you, you, you are run length encoded and had histogram based compression things of various sizes. And so at some point you came to, I've got a float that I'm going to load now and it wasn't aligned. And so you just did a misaligned load and you didn't care. And that was actually pretty quick on an x86. Um, so that was another unsafe, but I mostly I used unsafe on those arrays to get byte arrays that I could load longs and doubles and floats, even aligned. They, they would try to be aligned. If I wasn't doing funny compression, you would, you would get them aligned, but they would be a byte array. Yeah. On the, uh, the topic of var handles versus unsafe. So I, I still live in Java 8, so I haven't got to really play with var handles much. But boy, is that a complex API. If you haven't looked at it, every every method just takes in object dot, dot, dot. It's like, what the hell? like magically make up your own right, right combination of, of arguments, which I, I have to imagine there was a really good reason for that, but it, I, I, I first it doesn't make it, it very usable. Right. I first saw an API at a JVM Lang Summit. I looked at them funny and I said, if your goal is to speed up, you know, uh, uh, caching, inline cache behaviors for like Jython, JRuby and the like, there's a way the hell simpler way to do that. And what the hell are you guys doing? And they were like, no, we got this thing. And I'm looking at it funny like, dude, this is like the most worst case, I, you know, complexity for complexity sake thing I've ever seen. So I never looked back, you know, I, I threw my two bits out there and said, there's a better way and here it is. And they looked at me funny and I looked at them funny and we agreed to go our different ways. Well, the, I the better way be being unsafe. Uh, no, no. For, for the goal of doing uh, uh, calls to other targets, you, inline cache calls to other targets. The, the simple answer was having fields that were having a field that the compiler would recognize was a write once field. Were it to change, he had to deoptimize. So it's a C2 hack to go to teach C2, GC, interpreter hack. We did this kind of thing. It happened fairly often, not often, often, but it happened. Where you taught the compiler that a certain field ever got set once. After that, it was basically a compile time constant. Um, and so once it got changed and then you jitted the call and, and then, then the, the person would load that field and do a, a virtual call off of it. Um, the compiler would look at the field contents, decide he knew the class, and therefore he could jit in the vtable call right on the spot. And so you would get the behavior of an inline cache call on a field whose type got set dynamically by the, you know, JRuby, Jython, whoever code. Um, so you just didn't have any changes in the bytecodes. You would just write a, have a write once field. And it's very easy for the runtime to track a write once field. So it's not, not nothing to track it, but it's pretty damn simple to track a write once field. And, and that's it. And the JIT has to come in and say, this is a write once field and I'm post the write. So I have the value. It's a compile time constant. If it changes, I'll blow the code out and recompile. And that would give me, you know, for things that had to get or analyzed once, decide what they call, but didn't get changed afterwards, you were done. That was the proposal I threw out on the table and they looked at me funny and I looked at them funny and I guess we walked the different ways. I, yeah, I want to say that they, if the interface looks ugly, well, the implementation is even more convoluted and, and weird. And we are still fleshing out bugs, which, which caused by introduction of these things. Like for example, in before, JSR 292 uh, Java signatures of the call and the Kali uh, have to match exactly. Like with all this dynamic stuff, now there might be some some discrepancies which are allowed, and there are a lot of invariants uh, like around the code base which assume old behavior, and just yeah, just recently fixed one more of these. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't remember loader constraints, multiple class loaders and loader constraints. I found a bug there while I was at Azul in the Sun base database uh, code base that was triggered when C2 honored the loader configure and the runtime did not, leading to an infinite C2 deopt recompile cycle. And the fix was sort of kind of straightforward, but the point was it was so freaking complicated that no one understood all the parts and that's why the bug existed. And that let me have like a, a eh, roughly 10 lines of Java code, like three different methods of which one swapped out for the other. You Java seed them all, you swapped the bits in the jar file and he took the wrong loader constraint and then I broke security model. Um, so I had a test case, which I handed back to Sun and it sat there for a decade before Sun fixed it. Uh, and periodically I got questions, hey, is this still buggy? And I whipped up my old test case from the Sun bug database and I loaded it and ran it and I broke security and I said, I just ran the test case I gave you a decade ago, it's still broken. <laughs> this shit gets complicated. I, I don't know what the hell to say. And there's no point to it. That was the funny thing. It's just like, what the fuck guys? Why did you even go here? Fine. I'm 100% I'm supportive of our Shit just gets crazy. Yeah, and the more we retrofit into the existing like runtime system, the more convoluted it becomes. Like the value types. Uh, yeah, that's exciting and scary at the same time because like the whole system was was not designed with this in mind. So now it's just trying to squeeze it in, and I'm terrified of the idea. Okay, when when it's finally there. Uh, when we need to port it and support in uh, in Zing, well, there will be there will be bugs. Yeah, yeah, I can well imagine that, and and subtle and difficult to find ones. Yeah, and this is just for his like, it is complicated for historic reasons. It's just well, we didn't think about this first place. Then we had to put it into existing system that resulted in a very convoluted design. So, yeah. I guess it's just the nature of things. Like if, if you That's want to- had a lot of new ground and a lot of directions that led to a lot of complexity. Um, and at this point in its life, I'd say, yeah. Ma major rethink, redo, new language, or, or shoehorn in and give up on some of these other cool best, best of breed effort ideas in exchange for keeping the runtime mutable, like, like how hard is it to add all of our handles? Well, you're still pulling bugs out. So, you know, value types will show up and there'll be a year, two years reporting effort. And then the bugs will be coming out for the next five years afterwards. And that's the rate of change that is allowed in such a complicated thing. Yeah, the, I'm curious where, it's, where it is the point where it's just easier to start from scratch and build, build a clean design. That's what the Grail guys are trying to do. So I don't know what the hell what what the hell hold them up. That they they were at they've been at Grail for fifteen years or more. I won't say twenty yet, but a long time, and it's just catching up to C two. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I did a good job, but I kind of expected it to be overrun a long time ago. Well, so, uh, the 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 enterprise version of it is actually. Uh, it's actually good. I think it's uh, it's beating Oracle C2 um, uh, in many places. Um, but it, this is okay. Uh, this is the compiler part. Like I, the compiler part is somewhat easy because uh, it's it's more isolated. Uh, but when we look at the runtime as a whole, yeah. there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of like interdependencies between different parts, and um, yeah, my um, you know, my first whatever, three, four or five months at Azul was redoing big chunks of the runtime. I don't know, you guys are using the, the runtime that I hacked? You have to be, right? Using the, the GC. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I pulled out a shit ton of really bad complexity in the first three months um, when the, with a giant rewrite that did all the thread handling, all the runtime interactions with um, exceptions and stack crawling. And there was another major safe point locking there was another major hack that was part of that trinary of complexity that Oracle's still dealing with. Yeah, uh, we're at the 
we're at the point where uh, we we have the code base which um, diverged from from Oracle from OpenGDK a lot, and um, like it's unclear whether whether maintaining it and evolving our code base is the best strategy, or we should just port things we have into latest OpenGDK and then try to be in sync in parts which we don't differ and just have like GC and, uh, and compiler as separate things. Just the, the maintenance burden and uh, like backporting things, like it costs us uh, just because we have, we have code base which diverged. Hey Zen, um, yeah, I, I I I find that readable. We I we can we can finish the the um uh, Azure's uh, compiler things and then talk about this kind of uh, IR thing. Oh, we, I I think we can switch. Uh, I'm just <laughs> rambling. <laughs> right, but so I'm I'm feeling rambling. You're feeling rambling. Fine. Yeah. So when I draw IR myself. I typically draw the labels, the label nodes in the same box as the main head. So an if would have a T, you know, F at the bottom. And I give them a little box, so I know it's another node, but I totally abut them in the one, there's one grid with the two boxes split out down here as part of the same bigger box. And that's how I describe that. And so that's how I get the label. It's not the same as labeling the edge directly, but it's a, it's a visual tweak left or right. I, I find the labels fine. Um, personally, um, I feel that using the IGV and um, ideal graph visualizer um, is uh, like a dreadful experience. So it sounds like you guys don't use them at all. You don't use those visualizer. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you just print out uh, some kind of ideal graph in console uh, into your console and uh, try to draw some kind of region or a, a, a partial or a subgraph of this IR and work on it. Let's see, here you go. I, I dumped out some IR. You have to have a, in the chat, you have to have it very wide. It's not hugely readable because I went too wide and I'm putting too much junk in there. But it says shit like 424 colon new star 13, that's alias number 13 on a new. And then 424 is the node number for new. And then 516, 428, 450, those are node numbers for the inputs to the new. The double brackets and then the, the two node numbers are the outputs. It's a graph being printed in linear form. Now, I print that into my Emacs buffer. And then I search and hunt around in Emacs to go find things. So if I go down from the new, there's a D proj and an emerge proj. That's two projections. That's labeled edges. One to the pointer, one to the content of memory. That's D for pointer and merge proj for the memory. There's uh, a function pointer, star B. There's a two, which is a constant two. There's a dot A equals. That's an assignment to field A, which takes as a value the last thing, 513, node 513, which is the constant two, just one line above it. And it takes a prior sets of an input in a memory, an address pointer in a memory. Fine. So, so all I'm saying here is I do this kind of textual dump mm -hmm. as my daily, daily debugging tool. And I have all variations. So shorter lists and longer lists. I, I pick a node number. I have a short find. I, I, I have a debugging macro find that gives me, the, gives me a node number, gives me the node. Where I might look at the node directly and I might say dot dump on the node and then give a default for nothing. These are all very short expressions so I can type them really fast. Or I might say dump five lines or dump five node links, dump forwards, dump backwards, indent or not. Yeah. Dump only the control edges. There's a bunch of variations, but it's all textual dumps. Okay. And this is much faster and easier, but I have the semantics of the IR in my head already. So, so not, not necessarily what the graph shape of the moment looks like. That's what the visualizer is trying to do, but I know what the meaning is. Okay. But, but still, I feel that uh, C of nodes is a very low level IR. 
For example, one line of Java can generate like about like 500 nodes, right? There are like, there will be like thousands of edges where the map, so it's very low level thing. I, I'll tell you where the edges and nodes are. And then if you look at some other IRs, they have the same effect, but they do it a different way. And then they lose the chance to do the U-step edges directly in exchange for dropping some of the bits. And they have to rediscover them. And so they run passes to go rediscover this data, which C2 directly represents. That, that's sort of the difference here. I have all of the analyses already done all the time. And everything you do in the IR essentially does an incremental analysis as part of everything else it does normally anyhow. Right, so, so there's a, you know, there's an edge for your ads for the two inputs on an ad, and then there's output edges according to who uses the result of an ad. And an if takes a control edge and takes a predicate. And it produces out a true and a false edge to nodes. And then the nodes have whoever uses from true and who uses from false. You get one control user and you get however many guarded if tests, memory edges, and, and so on and so forth. So there's an edge for memory. There's an edge for memory for every differently alias memory. Um, which is typically unique field offsets off of unique object types. And, and if you add, do, do the math on it, yeah, it adds up. And then I tried, like I said, I, I've done uh, compilers for a very long time. I've done them old school. I've done them data flow ways. I've done them C2. I've done variations on C2. And this approach mm -hmm. is much, <clears throat> in the end, it's much simpler semantically. The actual behavior of any given node, and there's only a dozen varieties, is all very straightforward. The, 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 the semantics are, are very simple. Followed by, I can now do sort of fairly straightforward, you know, graph rewrite rules, and I have all my, you know, optimizations, analyses online all time available at every step. And that just leads to having this really faster way to go. All right, now where are trolls? I, I got the new fellow just show, oh, here he is. Yeah, fine, sorry, I'm a bit of, um. Oh, speaking of the earlier analysis, um, can I say that the C2's uh, memory, memory SSA is same like uh, GCC's memory SSA? I don't know GCC's memory SSA. But I can so far, tell you what C2's memory SSA looks like. Yeah, it, it's kind of like, a, it's like, a, you know, early version of GCC doesn't have like memory SSA. And, but I found that C2 had, had it, uh, had, 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 had it at the, at the beginning. So, but uh, um, you, you don't tell every single variable, every single um, memory spot, right? You, you, it, it looks like you use like a type, Java type to, to dis, disambulate uh, all, all the memories. Yes, so, so some significant piece of work back in the 90s said that if I take the best possible alias analysis I've ever seen from IBM, who was the forerunner and better compiler technology at that time, and I look at the set of transformations and optimizations that come from it, and I compare that to doing the equivalence class alias relationship, which is what C2 does, the equivalence class alias relationship gives me 95% of all gains I'll ever get from having the best, most expensive possible alias analysis. And an equivalence class aliasing is essentially trivial. Equivalence. So C2 does equivalence class aliasing. Every unique object with field offset is known to be independent directly. That's the edges that you get out of C2 directly. And that's the SSA form is on that style of edges. And that covers, like I said, known to cover 95% of the best goodness I'll ever get. There's a little bit of beyond equivalence class, what I call the Oracle class, or the Oracle's whatever the hell I want to make an Oracle, however smart, around loops with known striding offsets that I can do stencil calculations and the like with. Outside of that, it's just aliasing, equivalence class aliasing. 
Yeah, I, th I think there are two parts here. Uh, the first one is uh, the way you represent aliasing information. And yeah, I think it's a good comparison to say that uh, memory SSA in, um, in GCC or LLVM is similar to this explicit representation of memory dependencies in, in C2 graph. And the, the other part is, well, where do you get these aliasing facts? And uh, that's, that's what you were just talking about. I get them about. from the byte coach directly yeah. and I'm done. I don't, there's no there's no analysis per se. It's it's bytecodes. Yeah, and then and then every transformation you maintain these edges. This way you maintain the aliasing information. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, where um, in like theoretically you can have a separate analysis which refines the graph by finding some other facts. Like okay, this is not uh, this is not a clobber. I would change the edge to to point to some actual clobber for the load. Well, you, you can show, for instance, that at two different versions of uh, hash map entries, map entries are independent because they were yeah. analyzed yeah. from two different news or whatever. And then you, they don't alias, and then you can start to you know, slide the memory around to do better scheduling and the like. Mm -hmm. Right. But I, 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 like I said, I went down the path long ago. It worked out really, really well. C2 has been hard to beat in that sense. And it doesn't require any effort. The, the effort to maintain it is is basically trivial. You have to not, if you have an input edge to a load or store, that's your memory edge, and you do a transformation with some other guy, you have to maintain the input or the output edges for the memory that state that came. But that's it. And you know, the maintenance is just you drew a circle around some piece of the graph, included some memory edges in and out. And when you replaced the guts inside, there was always still the edges of the circle had to be reconnected, and then that was the maintenance, and you were done. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know how this works for unsafe? I suppose you just get the alias from the field offset, right? Yeah. 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 Unsafe, I, I do a little more conservative on. I give up on um, on trying to understand that the pointer base is independent unless I can show the pointer base comes from Java objects. So if that, if it's Java object pointer base, I get that aliasing level. If the offset and the and the size of the unsafe access are co constants, then I use that. Um, but as soon as I have an unsafe which has an unknown offset, which is pretty common, I basically give it up. And 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 when I say give it up, what I really mean is they go to the same alias class as some other non-unsafe, and they force forcibly serialize. Is what it turns into. Yeah. Oh, uh, speaking of the alias classes, I feel that uh, the 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 maximum number of alias classes um, is uh, close to the number of different classes. It's the number of different fields. Different field, but well, but uh, if, what's if uh, field uh, different field with uh, same class or same uh, same type? So uh, nothing they to do with the type to of the field. The... Nothing to do with the type of the field. It's the offset of the field and the class the field came from. Okay, you well, you have more more aliases even than that, right? Because scalarized objects get their own ones. Yeah, right. There, there are more. I, I, I'm giving you the base minimum easy to do. New things get an instant alias class all their own until they mix it up with old things. So there's a, a mixing thing going on here um, where you, you give it up and say this thing is no longer a new. It's a now part of the base. I made a new whatever, map that entry, a new person object. Well, it's, while it's not aliased, it's a new person, it's all, it's independent own thing. And the memory edge is all, or only feeding to and from itself. And so I can highly optimize along a path. In particular, I usually do a lot of constructor goodness there. But as soon as I mix the pointers, then I mix the memories for the persons and I give it up after that point and say, from here on, I don't have an independent new person and an old other peoples. I, all the peoples are just all the peoples. So that, that piece, has what I call the Oracle knowledge for a little while. And then the Oracle steps in at the merge point and says, now you lose and give it up. And go back to being person plus offset 
where all the peoples are on the same footing. I guess the common hot case you're interested in is like uh, iterators that you want to expand unaliased for all the multiple iterators in the same function. You want to know they're all independently different iterators so that they all inline independently and then they fold up independently and you, your iterator disappears. Um, and to make that happen, you have to have a new iterator not get confused with another new iterator, which when I, by the time I left Sun, that was working for non-nested iterator consumption and maybe was easily done or doable for nested ones barely. There was definitely some things going on there. It was close, you know, it, I had it going, but it was not necessarily all 100%, but it wasn't far from it. We worked on this at Convex in the late 80s, early 90s, and we had something like a equivalence class approach, but I seem to recall getting into trouble with transitive closure uh, problems when we tried to iterate over the whole call graph. But it's been so long, I actually don't remember what the gating issues were anymore. So I'm doing this with AA aggressively over the whole call graph, but I have a whole lot more theory on it now than I did back when I did C2. And because of the heavyweight theory I'm throwing around, I call it heavyweight, it's, it's lattice theory that I've sort of butched the hell out of. Um, I get these guarantees that I didn't know how to express at C2, at, 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 well, at Sun. I didn't, know, I didn't understand the invariance, the necessary. Now I have the right invariance, I get the right answer for having equivalence class across the whole program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of cool stuff. There, there I, some... I can head down that path. In fact, I got somebody who wants to talk to me about where well, they're trying to get me hooked into their language, but you know, you imagine camera trying to get me drug into XTC, fine. So we're gonna have a more in-depth discussion on language design and I'm, I'm gonna see if I can't. I, I don't think you'd like XTC because we support variables with more than one character. Yeah, that's tough, I don't know. <laughs> I use I use descriptive variable names for variables that last more than go ahead go down your go down your path let's I wasn't supposed to discourage you tell us tell us more on the lattice theory for equivalence classes um I you know I don't know how to describe it so I was trying to come up with visualize this is like what visual tools or work out we're gonna talk because that gives me a week to force myself to how to teach so I use a lattice. So people here know what a lattice is. Before I go any further, people know what a lattice is? Like in a high level way, not necessarily the mathematical, all the bells and whistles. Anyone here not know what I mean when I say a lattice? I keep reading the articles, but I keep not understanding it. Fine, that's good enough. Okay, so here's, I don't, boom, boom, mixed up. Okay, fine. So, so um, I have a structure which has, so, so constant propagation. People all know what constant propagation is, right? The optimistic constant propagation version where you have a, a, a set of constants, you know, minus infinity, plus one, up to integers only, just do integers only constants up to plus infinity. Um, and then there's a top and a bottom. And, the, and the, the, the bottom up version says, I don't know what anything is, so I declare it bottom. But if I have a constant like two, I know what a two is. And if I have two and I have a one, I add them, I can fold the constant math and get a three. Um, and then I can produce constants from bottom if I start with enough constants. The top down version says, I'm gonna assume everybody is the best possible option. They're all constants all the time. Wow, what did I do here? I smeared chocolate around in a bad way. <laughs> um, Everyone's the best possible opportunity to be a constant. And, and this is the optimistic standard constant propagation algorithm I'm talking here, totally standard. And then you flow forward with the constants you actually have. And you know that, you know, reading from the command line gives you a bottom. You don't know what you're going to read and so on and so forth. But when you come to a loop, if something's a constant coming in and it's a back edge and you don't know what's on the back edge, if you do the bottom up version, you fail because the bottom, you don't know what it is. So you have a bottom at the top of the loop and you propagate the bottom through and the bottom, you hit the bottom, you bring the bottom right to the top and you're a closed, uh, at your, your, your fixed point solution with just bottoms. If you flip that and say, I come in with the top, it can be any constant, but I know it's, I'm sorry, it's the top around the back edge. I come in with a one at the top around the back edge and I do my math with the one and it's still a one at the bottom. I bring a one around, I've discovered a constant one. So this is classic constant propagation. And I can do things like, 
I have a, a one flowing in and I say two minus X in the body of the loop, well, two minus one is one. And so I can flow my one and preserve a constant in the face of math. So, so out of this comes this notion is I have a top and a bottom and, and some constants. And I have a meet and a join and the phi function at the head of a loop was the meet. And the meet just says, take the worst case scenario of my left and my right. So if I have a bottom on the right and I have a one on the left, I go to bottom. If I have one on the right and a two on the left and I compare them, they're not the same, I go to bottom. But if I have one and a one, it's a one and I'm done. So that's the standard meet in this kind of scenario. I also have transfer functions, like add of one and two making three is a transfer function. So the lattice, to, to run constant propagation algorithm correctly, to have it actually function at all, you have to have a bunch of properties on your lattice. And the properties include its bounded depth, or you keep falling in the lattice from top to constant to bottom. Suppose you have a range in the lattice where instead of saying constant's one, I say my range is from one to two, one to three, one to four, um, because I want to get small range data sets and switches for enums, for instance. So that's the goal of that one. But if I don't have a limit to how far I can widen, every time I have a for loop that says for i equals one to a bazillion, it widens, i is one, i is one to two, i is one to three, i is one to four, i is one to bazillions, and it widens forever, and the loop never, your constant propagation analysis never terminates. So you have to have a, a depth of the lattice that is finite in height. And that's the running time is linear times the depth of your lattice, okay? You have to have a complete lattice, which is if I meet two things, I get something else in the lattice, or I make two things and I came something out of the lattice, and now I can't meet it with anything else. I don't know what to do with it, right? Your transfer functions have to be monotonic, meaning that they can't go up and down and up and down. If their inputs fall in the lattice, sorry, hang on, I'm going to outside. then the transfer function has to monotonically go the same direction. So there's a couple rules. They're not too hard. Um, but in complicated worlds, yeah, there's a big discussion here. In the complicated worlds, you make mistakes. So you have to have testing in actual production all the time to verify these invariants or you screw them up. OK. So there is your, your starting lattice. If your lattice is not symmetric between top and bottom, you, you can lose information uh, because you were in the dull part in one pace and a sharp part elsewhere. And if you visit things in the wrong order, you can get to dull too soon and you lose data. So your lattice wants to be symmetric. It wants to be, to be a lattice, it has to be commutative. So I can do A meet B is the same as B meet A. And it wants to be distributive and associative and those properties fall out of there, then you can decide, and I said there was a join, which is the going up in the lattice instead of going down, it's the inverse of meet. Um, I do uh, uh, meet and dual, which gives me the symmetry option, and join is just a function on meet and dual. And in fact, of them, of meet, dual, and join, you know, need only two out of those three to define a lattice. So I do meet and dual instead of meet and join. Uh, Cliff, can I you maybe to... explain what meet and join are? I, I think yeah. I kind of understand them, but as a Okay, definitely... and somebody else had a question too. So let me do this one and I'll get the next one. So meet is take two elements in the lattice and find the common point that is below in the lattice. Like I did a vertical lattice with top at the top and bottom at the bottom. Meet would be fall downhill to the least common ancestor. Furthermore, to be the lattice, there must be exactly one. Therefore, the meat has to be unique or you're not a lattice. So there so are a couple structures that look really cool. You can go on the wiki page for lattice order. Search for wiki lattice order in that order and you'll get a, the right page. Roll down to image number six, seven, like that. And you'll see some examples of things that look like a lattice that are not. Whereas images one, two, three will be like definitely lattices. But they're, they're pretty simple looking structures. And, and this is sort of where I started from. Okay, did that answer your question? Let me back up. Did that answer your question on meet and join? Yeah, yeah. So I think I kind of get it, but um, maybe for everyone. Oh, uh, I, so I, to, to have a co concrete example, let's say you have a constant two and a constant three, the meet of that will be two or three. No, basically. the le no? meet will be bottom. Meet will be bottom. So you get two and three. You lose information. The lattice I'm describing is very simple. It does not hold very many kinds of facts. So you can have a lattice that knows more, but the lattice of just integer constants and top and bottom, if you meet two and three, there is no representation that says, I don't know, it's either two or three, but I don't know which one. There is no representation in the lattice. So you have to go to the next most conservative solution, which is bottom. So bottom is unknown. Okay. 
I, I, bottom is, I don't know what it is. I have to compute it. And I felt the integer. Sorry. And go how ahead. would you describe top then? The so top bottom, is this funny bottom thing is unknown. Off, and it's really crucial to get your head wrapped around top, and it's not obvious. In this particular lattice, top is all possible constants all at the same time. It's two and it's three. And four and five and six and all of them. Yeah, so if you yeah, so if two and three meet, you don't you get I think the integer types in C two have a range that they can be, right? So you the get C two types have a more have a more expressive lattice. So okay. what I've done in AA is I have really beefed the hell out of the lattice a lot. So C2 went to a more expressive lattice. One of the properties is that integers have a range. So they can represent, it's two or it's three, I don't know which one, but it's not four and it's not zero. Yeah. And there's- and You have two and four, you have two and four, maybe it cannot be three, but you can express that, right? I you cannot can express that, yes. So I have a range two to four. Yeah. Yes, in, yes, it's the bottom. Yes, that is correct. Zin, except it's, I wanna say it's naive in the sense that I can have a more complicated lattice where I have things that aren't integer constants, but integer ranges. And therefore I can have things that are not bottom and not a constant. And all of these have an inverse. So the inverse of the range of two to three is the outer range. All possible choices of integers except two and three. Yeah, the question I had uh, for, for meet and join, I can, like, th there is an example in code where you use it. So meet is when you have different code paths coming into one point and you want to represent a value, uh, which is, you want to represent the fact which is true for all incoming paths. Yes. So that's how you get meet. Yes. For join, you have different facts about one same value and you get a join of these different facts to know something yeah. about this. Join value. in a forward flow propagation kind of situation, you can imagine as a cast. I do an if task to say you're not null. On the true side where I know you're not null, I can join you with the not null universe. Yeah, you, basically you have extra fact about the value and you combine uh, this extra fact. So yeah. th this, is, uh, this is like half, I can see clear mapping to construct, but the dual you use in C2, does it have a similar like mapping to, to program structure? Or uh, how do I wrap my head around the dual? Yeah, okay, fine. So the point of the dual, and it is that conversation just had, of meet, join, and dual, I only need two to describe a lattice. So I dropped join, I'm describing the lattice with meet and dual. Now to get join, join is dual to the left, dual to the right, do a meet, dual the result. So join has a one line implementation in the type.hpp that says dual, dual, meet, join, dual, uh, dual, dual, meet, dual. And what, what, was, what was the reason to, to choose these two? Like I can understand what join and meet for. Uh, why, why join, why meet and dual? Cause, yeah. so meet, meet because I understood what meet is. Dual yeah. because it's simple in a symmetric lattice. If okay, my lattice so is symmetric, which I already said I want because it preserves the guarantee of an optimality on a work list algorithm, then dual is simply find the symmetric opposite, which typically is a trivial operation for everybody. I just do the obvious invert. Whereas meet is, gets complicated. So meet is a very complicated breakdown. I do virtual meet on the left and then virtual on the right. I do horrible triangulation. I, meet is complicated and big. Dual is always a one-liner. I didn't want to have curious. to make a point that was complicated. I'm curious if the, um, if the use of the, the lattice is particularly useful with, the, with respect to the sea of nodes approach because I, I've never had to do anything like a, a lattice for constant propagation. And- uh, But you did, you just didn't know it. Well, so, uh, you know, I'm starting from, uh, you know, from an AST. So with the AST, you just ask the node, what's your constant value? Right, and you pushed forward. And when you came to a loop 
and you had a value on the left and a value on the right, what'd you do? You did a meet from the back edge of the loop. You had uh, a lattice. Uh, yes, of course. Yes. Okay. So for so for tight uh, right for say uh, yes. Yeah, so so you would hit this for example with uh, definite assignment, definite on assignment uh, determination, right? So if I have a loop that can execute an unknown number of times, entering the loop, I have uh, potentially entering the loop. I'm definitely unassigned. Potentially exiting the loop, I'm definitely assigned. But if the loop can run zero times, I can't prove that I'm either definitely. Oh, uh, you have an if guard test around the loop then. I, I mean, I, I did it loops that run zero times with a test at the start, which is a zero trip count test. Right. So you have, well, you have while versus do while from a syntax point of view. So you have. Right. Uh, and, and in the C2IR, that turned into I had an if test at the start which I typically peel because of the, and this is constant propagation straight up, because there are a lot of tests that were made that were tested every trip on the same value. Null checking in a variable that's get used in the body of the loop. I don't, don't put a null check on every trip through the loop. So I peel one iteration. So <clears throat> basically the if test against null gives me the property that's not null, <clears throat> which I then use if I'm in the body of the loop but I carry the same value on the back edge and at the back edge, I lose the notion that it's not null. I have to retest because I did a meet of an unknown coming in and a known yes. not null coming around. And so I have an unknown and I have to retest. Yeah. So we don't call it a lattice, but yeah, of course for, for okay. So the reason for lattice is yeah. so I can hammer out some massive theory and then go to the next step. So it, you have a lattice, you just didn't call it one. And I'd lived in the same realm forever in a day too. I mean, I went through grad school and I got taught lattice, but I didn't care. Cost propagation was easy. And then you had a bottomy thing and I, nah, 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 I didn't care, right? It, it wasn't, it was an unknown versus a known, and, but it was a lattice. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any education, so. I, it, the theory in here is I got it one time in one grad class and then I never looked at it back except when I hit C2 and I started saying, hey, we're gonna do this thing. Um, so I kept expanding the lattice in C2 um, oh. to add more facts to it. So another fact is something's null or not null. Um, so that's a lattice which says it's exactly a null, it's something that's not null, and then there's another place that says you're a constant like a string where I know the pointer and the pointer has no other choices. Uh, and then that piece of the lattice flows just the same way. And so I can flow nullness or not nullness in the same lattice. And the same meet operators behave the same way. And then there's subtyping where I can say, you're an integer, you're a number, which is a subclass. And I knew that, and I knew your number exactly or number in subclass. So the lattice of those is your base object is precise or imprecise if you included all the subclasses underneath. And that gets flowed forward. And that turns into killing off all the casts that are redundant and pushing not type knowledge forward. Occasionally the Oracle kicks in. I say, if you an instance of an X and I join you with a cast, so the cast is a join now. And so I gather more data and say, here I've joined you because I did an instance of test. The Oracle can kick in and say, ah, but there were only two choices here. So the other side gets to be cast to the other flavor. Right, so there's a, there's a couple of places where I, I do an Oracle style yep. um, cast, cast on the known if test is true, cast on the false side, occasionally- You have something that. similar with a switch if you're covering the entirety of an enumeration, for yes, example. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And my yep. goal of doing integer ranges was to cover switches of small integer values. And, and if you knew the entire range, you could start to say something about like the default path can't be taken. Yeah, we do the same thing, but we don't call it lettuce. That's fine. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now that I have a lattice, I get a bunch of other things out of this. So every time I take, const take values, which are described by the lattice into an abstract interpretation of a function like an add or a switch statement or an if, and I get a value out, if I show that those, yes, cast is a join, is in, um, and I get those values out, I can now claim that if the, the transfer function, if that thing, I call that thing a transfer function from historical formal theory long ago. If, if that thing is monotonic, I will guarantee you forward progress 
in your standard constant propagation algorithm across all varieties of all things I've described so far, plus everything else I've ever come up with. And if it's not monotonic, I can write you a program which will loop forever and never terminate nor the constant propagation will never terminate. Most folks accidentally are monotonic, and in the few places where they are not monotonic in one operator, they're typically strongly normalizing, strongly monotonic somewhere else, and they lose facts really fast. And then that forces them downhill, and then they end up terminating. However, if you are not monotonic, and I only make a tight loop where you're not monotonic, that loop will never terminate because you will always have a change be made, and you'll just spin forever and ever in a day. In the analysis, you mean? In the analysis, yeah, in the analysis. Right, 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 right. The constant propagation requires that the propagation piece be monotonic or else you will fail to terminate in any of the obvious work, work list algorithm. Okay. Actually, I have a question about this monotonic thing. There are like hundreds of different graph rewriting rules. Uh, in different uh, CPP file files, right? So, so everybody can check in and uh, can check in and 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 kind of new rules, so arbitrarily. So, how can we guarantee that uh, the okay, new so rule is monotonic? Right, right. So let's break this out. The value calls in C two and the identity call. So I have the value call. The value call has to be monotonic. The graph rewrite rules have a different property associated with them. That property is not, <laughs> that the property you're looking for in the graph rewrite rules is the one step church roster property. Which, say it again. Uh, one, one step, I want to say, I, I'm not saying it right. It's church roster is two names, and it's the one step church roster property which is that you are, uh, uh, that will guarantee, this is from Lambda theory. This will guarantee you that you will hit the same normal form after all transforms are applied in any order. That is not the case for C2, where an unfortunate ordering of application of, of uh, graph rewrite rules can lose you the, the uh, can lose you optimality. Um, and that's just, part and parcel of where C2 is at right now. It, it is strongly normalizing, but you can arrange that there is a slightly different work list visitation order that will cause you to get a different answer in terms of the precision of the result. This is separate from constant propagation. So let's break out graph rewrite from constant propagation. Okay, so, so the, the constant propagation thing that I'm headed for with AA gets me everything that can be had up to the precision that I would get improved by, by a graph rewrite rule, which duplicates pieces of the graph to allow me to maintain precision along different paths. Yes, best effort optimizers in that. Is, you're exactly right, correct there. Um, so what I'm doing in AA is I am headed for getting back the one step church roster property by verifying that I can apply my rules, my graph rewrite rules in any order, and C2 is a long ways from this, and, and get the same answer every time. So these are both separate from the constant propagation, which has this convenient global property, global optimistic property, that lets you do a bunch of other things that are really handy. So I talked about ranges in C2, where I do integer ranges. I got you floats and float constants, and I did null and subtyping and, and super typing and interfaces, and it's conditional, so there's control flow within a compilation unit. So in AA, besides all of these, I'm also doing uh, call graph analyses with first class functions. And I'm also doing liveness, all in the optimistic way, all in the same graph lattice, so that I get a, a, a highly precise, call graph and a first class functional language or function pointers are being passed around willy nilly. I get a highly precise call graph um, because they, they flow through the lattice just directly. And I don't know, there are 17 other things thrown into the lattice at this point now. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, right. Generalized, it's a super generalized constant propagation algorithm. Right. You, you, yes, as long as you're consistent on your meets and joints. So, so I have, as part of engineering a compiler, I have strong tests that validate that my lattice is a lattice. 
Um, in particular, uh, uh, Cameron and I have talked a long time about null, and I finally came up with how I'm handling null that preserves the lattice property, because the, the obvious way you handle null does not preserve the lattice property, and it leads to all kind of fail modes down the road. Um, and then, uh, yeah, see ya. In fact, in fact here, here's the fun thing. From my null, I have a signed null. I have a positive null and a negative null. It sucks. There's only one obvious one that you end up using, except I have to have the reverse one every time I start at tops everywhere and do the optimistic version and fall, you fall through the obvious one. Um, anyhow, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought, doesn't matter. Fine, I'm doing, doing hell, hell and gone lattice theory and because I have a strong formal theory, I, I, I know I'm getting optimal results up to uh, one step church Rosher property on graph rewrite rules, which I'm pretty close to on that one. I also have very strong normalizing on graph rewrite rules, but I'm not 100% there. So mostly what goes on with graph rewrite rules and the value rules is the graph rewrite removes the need to compute a value, but the value preserves type information precisely through the transform um, that the value that the I, that the deal call the graph rewrite rule removes. So there's no gain or loss of information whether or not you did the graph rewrite rule. The, typically the graph shrinks, gets smaller, more obviously more optimal, but it didn't gain or lose any information. And then the only obvious place where that breaks is when you have graph duplication of some kind that now gives you more nodes, not fewer, that can take independent types and preserve uh, uh, smarter type knowledge. And you have to guarantee to get to get back to an optimal, I want to say optimal, get back to a single answer, you have to guarantee the one-step to draw your property. So, so here's a here's a here's a test for you for C2 that will show you what I'm talking about. There is a work list algorithm that peels elements deterministically, but it's pseudo-random deterministic, but it's deterministic. Okay, change the random seed, run it to closure, completion, and see that your graphs are different or the same. And if they ever come up different, you've shown you don't have one optimal single answer. You've got a, a class of answers, and it's because one transformation can deny another, unless you have the one-step church roster property, which is where you validate it. Every single transform you do um, has exactly preserved the right information that every other transformation that would apply still applies or gets equivalently applied by the one you're doing. Yeah, actually, this this is what Oracle is doing right now. Um, like a couple of days ago, they checked in the code, uh, some kind of improvement for the random stress uh, iterative test. So what they are doing is uh, randomize the work list for the yeah. iterative GVN and make sure that uh, you still get like uh, the, the, the correct answer for the graph. Yeah, yeah. there's a correctness thing too. Although I, I'm, I'm much stronger on correctness tests than I ever was at C2 now, because I do hardcore force all case testing of individual nodes, value calls and the like. I'm not quite there on all the ideal calls, but I'm getting closer. And yeah, that, yeah, I, I, I trust you got to test the what you have written, but you know, because C2 is like open source project, so everybody can check in and some kind of new rules and a new value the, function, right? Yeah, what I'm I saying is want, I'm, I'm, I'm engineering a solution where any shit I check in gets checked this way as part of the normal testing. There is a for all nodes, apply all values and all orders and confirm monotonicity. That one's there. There is pieces and parts of for all nodes do graph rewrite rules in the planning and it's not there yet, but it's getting closer. And that would let me have the graph rewrite rules get the one step church roster property too. And that turns into knowing that the, the iter GVN converges to the same answer every time. Now you could argue it's optimal or it's not but it's definitely going to converge to the same answer independent of the workload order, which is actually a highly desirable property because it means code in, code out, doesn't matter how you do it. Um, and the work list visitation order, uh, there's definitely faster and slower ways right now in the proper yeah. C2. The reason it's pseudo random is because I would get n squared behaviors on graph rewrite walls for large, mono, large programs that were very, very similar shape, they're machine generated shit. 
I would visit them in the wrong order if I visited left or visited right. And I had to do basically universal hash to force random order picking, which in turn made it really, really hard to write the adversarial program that would trigger an n squared behavior on the graph rewrite rules. So it's asymptotically difficult to write that program, but you could reverse the universal hash and get it. It's just really, really hard. So I think, I think universal hashes are, are considered good enough um, that you, you claim it's still linear on C2 now, but I had to go to that step. Da, 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 da. Yes, bottom is non-const. So I'm, I've, uh, I'm reading through the, the, the stuff here on the chat. Um, yeah. One of the other fun things I did was in discovering that I couldn't make null be the obvious center line position for everybody in the lattice was I started making a lattice tester that takes a verbal, not quite verbal, it's a textual description of a lattice. It's code description of a lattice, a very simple code description of a lattice and tells you that it's a lattice. And then it's symmetric and commutative and distributive and associative and, and, and uh, I want to say uh, not unique, um, minimal removes extra edges in the description as well. Um, and with that one, I was able to universally prove myself that I can't have null in the center position. And that every time I did, I ran into one of pictures six or seven on that wiki page. That's definitely not a lattice for an obvious reason. It's not a lattice as somewhere as a subtype of a lattice. And that turned me into, you can't have null in the middle. And that turned into a long hunting period of many months where I finally figured out I had to have a sign null and actually sign null works and it's fine. When I write null in my program text, I get the high signed null, the upper one, but I have to have a lower one available and it shows up during constant propagation every time. And then it falls off to the bottom at some point, typically. Once it falls off the bottom, it falls off and becomes a flavored null of integer flavor or pointer flavor or float flavor or whatever other flavor of null there are and everyone has their own flavor. And that's how I'm getting so is. close to a working type system where you actually treat null as a type. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said you're getting so close to a working type system where null I have is a working a type. type system and null is a type. Yes, if you like. It, it happens to be effectively a subclass of all types, including integers and floats and pointers. I just, I just know somewhere Tony Hor is is laughing. It's it's fine. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've used null in this way for all my life. So I damn well wanted to make it work from a theoretical point of view. And I, and I have it now. I, I claim I've got null defeated and I'm working on other things that are, are, are slightly different edgy in the, in the lattice here. I, I, to do things with first class functions and first class aliasing citizens, I have bit vectors that have to have the right properties. To be efficient, everything is hash cons to death and gone. And so there's a lot of funny games to do with hash consing of bit vectors that I, I didn't quite get the representation right the last go round. And I'm, I'm tightening up my representation and I, we're getting it a little bit more expressive um, to handle the tops and the bottom. Handle symmetry, you have to have a top bit vector and a bottom bit vector. But actually you want top and bottom per bit which means I need two bits per bit. Two, two bits per, or, or, or a pair of bits. Yeah, a pair of bits. There, there's, a, there's a not present, there's a top and a bottom. Then there's an efficiency hack, which says, oh God, I know how to go, why I'm going on this path. So, so another hack I'm doing, this is not lattice theory hack per se. This is efficient representation of incremental algorithm. So I have a completely incremental algorithm as a consequence, incremental typing all the way. Um, everything is precisely, incrementally, provably optimal. We'll get the same answer with incremental steps in, in constant incremental time the whole way through. It's, it's, it's all the bells and whistles, fine. But to be incremental and a support cloning of code, so inlining a piece of code, inlining a getter and a setter to get a little more precision, I have to say I have this aliasing relationship or this functional relationship, some bit vector either way, and I made a clone. And now wherever you mention this one function, you might be mentioning one of two. Which one are you talking about? The, the, the new one or the old one? And if I want to be incremental, I don't want to visit my entire program text 
and make a decision on every bit and flip it to the left or the right choice for the child split. So I don't. So I have a tree structure implied on all my aliasing relationships and all my functional relationships. Pre the split, the parent is the parent for all possible future splits, and that's the optimal salute, optimal implementation strategy, optimal presentation strategy. Post split, the parent exists throughout the program, but will get refined to one of the two different children over time. It has to be before I have a correct answer in the end. Um, but I have a tree structure on my bets. And I have to have a canonical answer that gives me the same default answer as if I don't split the places where I didn't, where I don't present, the, where I don't visit after the split until later. And where I do the split, I want to immediately say, I'm my child on the left, I'm a child on the right. And so I have four states. There's, I'm an up, I'm a down, I'm not there at all, and I'm my parent. Go, go visit the parent in the tree, not me. I, I don't know who I am. I'm just the parent. I'm the same as the parent. And so that gives me an incremental solution for trees. So I have trees of bit vectors that I hash cons, which means there's a funny, I generated a new one and then I hashed it and, and got rid of the duplications. And 99.99% of everything is duplicates or, or even higher. It's ridiculous. But I have construction algorithms all, all over the place that say, Oh, take this type and make a small mutation on it. So it does an incremental mutation step. It incrementally copies the same as a persistent data structure. It incrementally copies the top level piece. It makes a tiny little mod and the incrementally copy top level piece. It hash cons as it gets a hit and it recycles all the structures back on the testing list. So there's no allocation actually ever made. And I come back with the correct new answer. And it takes, you know, dozen to, to hundreds of clock cycles depending on how big the top level minor mutation is. And that gives me very tightly refined, very small counts of objects that all fits hot in your L1. The struggle cache. is always between whether you have a maximally compressed piece of data at every node, or you have a, a sparse approach where you only fill it in on delta. Right? I'm filling in the delta and then compressing. So it's always the same as a, a, it's very similar, maybe, maybe not the same, it's very similar to what you do with persistent data structures. I have an existing structure. I'm oh, expecting sure. to make a delta. I do not want to accumulate deltas ad infinitum. So every step I accumulate the delta and rehash. And typically that hits every time in the cache and I get an old thing that has that same structure. Yep. And I only I've, did it at the top I've of done it. Picture. I've done it both ways actually. Cause in the, okay. uh, in the Java compiler years ago, I used the bit vector approach and then uh, dealt it on walking back up the graph. And on the compiler I'm working on now, I use the sparse approach, so I only realize the data structure if there's a delta. Effectively, when I have a delta, I get deltas all the time, though. Uh, OK, well, the, 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 the delta I come up with is often a no change delta. So I do do that optimal check. There's a lot of the, if the this is a that already, oh, I'm done. Just return the that and go away. Um, but there's often things that said, take a this and fiddle the thing on the right. And it failed to be what I expected or what I had in my hand. So I had to make a fiddle change. So I pull off the work list. I copy the bits. I change the fiddle bit. I hash. I get a hit. I take the hit back and return it and take the thing that I, I filled with and I put it back on the, on the, this is what I do to, Whatever. So it's hash consing with no allocation on a hit is the usual structure. Yes, node ideal. Uh, yes, no, you are correct. Ideal doesn't add new information, but sometimes it adds new precision capabilities, new opportunities for more precision. The typical ideal call just removes nodes in the graph that are dead <laughs> or are otherwise uninteresting in some way. Yeah, the reason, the reason I, I feel that this information is useful uh, because, you know, um, so somehow, uh, somehow I managed to remove or replace a node and the control input of that node is if force. It's if force node, which means I feel that, I feel that, uh, you know, this if force never, never unreachable, never reachable. 
Uh, so I feel that uh, I can simplify this if node somehow because I know that uh, you know okay. it cannot execute to if force. So okay. I can make it like a, a dummy if node. Yeah, can yeah, I no. do that? No, no, back up, back up. So, so you said that if false cannot ever be true, cannot be, have the value control. So if for everyone else, ifs produce a pair of controls independently for true and false nodes. So an if is followed by true and a false, and there's independent controls for them. Typically you don't know what the predicate value is. So you get both controls are possible. So you get a pair of tuple out control comma control for the false and true. If the if optimizes down to true or false or one or zero or whatever it's going to be, then you get a control and an X control or a top or whatever. How do you want to present the not control state or on one or the other? And the if node then internally has all the optimizations already that will just fold it up. So Zen, where you just said was, if I know if false can't execute, yes, that's the same as saying the predicate into the if is only ever non-zero. For instance, it's only ever a true value. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I uh, in the ideal function in the if node's ideal function, I modify that. Okay, there's only one single. There's only one single key for this if node. I can know that. I can modify the the, the compare. I can modify the compare node to see that it return true or one or zero. Is yeah. it legit? Is it legit to do this kind of manipulation thing? Because yeah, actually, right. because I, I I feel that I have added new information in the ideal function. Yeah, so, you just described, and then the if call, the if call has made a decision that it's only gonna pro produce a true or false. So there's a yes. couple ways to do that transformation. You can do it in the ideal call, you can do it in the value call. So okay, if, but if, I feel that I should do in value call because as you said, value call should add new information for this, for the ideal graph, right? Yeah, if you, yes, if you, if in this particular case, I would recommend doing the value call because the optimistic constant propagator will now actually get new facts from it. Right, the, the, the pessimistic value call getting a true or false, value can be called optimistic and pessimistically. If it's called, and it's monotonic, it's totally ambiguous which way you call it. It doesn't care, it doesn't know, fine. If the value calls during call during the pessimistic side and it comes up with a constant value of the if goes left or right, um, it, the, the, everything folds up the way you expect it to. If you do an ideal call, you do the fold yourself directly. If you put it in the value call though, the optimistic version may discover a new fact based on your new knowledge that you're teaching it. So you've taught it something new that hasn't been taught before about what programs can only turn true or false. Like if I compare X and Y, but somehow I know X and Y are unaliasable or otherwise independent, I can claim they'll never compare true. They'll always be false or unequal or whatever. And so the if will always fold left right. And you put that in the value call. Whereas an ideal call typically requires a thing that you discover that won't be true at one node. Value is only a fact at one node. So for instance, uh, unzipping optimization is I have an if null check a diamond, I flowed back together, I lost the not nullness, had another if of the same value and another diamond. And an unzipping one is where I duplicate the code at the join and I have an if test once that come down and where I would have another if test instead, I know the test went true or false the same way so I can stay independent and join finally at the bottom, the second join, second join at the bottom. So that's called unzipping. That's an ideal graph transformation because it's not a fact that's known true at one node. Whereas an if being only false or only true is a fact known at one node and those go in ideal calls. Yeah, it's still kind of like a kind of a graph of morphing you. It's not like ending a new information teach the ideal graph or C2 uh, something new, so, right? The ideal yeah. graph is all about the transformation. It's not about ending new information or uh, inference. It, right, it, so right, the, the two, right, yes. Value gives you new facts at a node and applies in the optimistic constant propagation model. Ideal typically changes the graph shape, typically to reduce structure, but doesn't present new facts. It can, however, decide that you've got a dead path, like collapsing of a region that has a, a merge path where it's dead on one arm, 
that collapse, that's an ideal call. Value discovered that's dead in one arm, the ideal call, chop the dead arm off, and then the dead code elimination piece, it just says I have no uses, so those e nodes eat each other up in the graph until you know, the, the dead arm disappears. Those are all ideal calls. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. Yeah. And identity was for my thesis, which never got implemented in C2. It's an ideal call that just says, I am exactly a that, but there's an optimistic version of it that requires a, a change to the constant propagation algorithm to do value numbering optimistically. Okay. Uh, will, will, you, will you do that when you do the, your theory in your AA programming language? I might. I, what I don't have in my head is what is the productive use for doing it on values. The obvious way that you win where you don't get it anywhere else is having the functions that are redundant but complicatedly intertwining all throughout but it's only the same value ultimately and getting rid of the, the nested mess of them. Like if they have a fee that's taking a value in and it takes the same value in on the, on the, the same node comes in, the fee will collapse. That's a simple one. If they have a fee that's referring to itself on a loop, then that's another collapsible case. As soon as I have two or four fees that interlink in some complicated pattern, I'm not gonna get that. Um, and that can happen if you have sort of messed up control flow because you have finalizers doing irreducible loops that you've unrolled and you suddenly get the horrible growth factor for unrolling irreducible loops with, you know, the finalizers throwing control flow every which way. And it's the same value on all of them, but it's all an intertwined knot. It's a Gordian knot. How do you unwind the Gordian knot? Well, my thesis will unwind that Gordian knot. How common is that Gordian knot? Don't know. I can write it, I've seen it, I know it happens, I don't know it happens very much. So th there's a different argument that says I wanna have the, the value numbering style technology thrown in because there's something else I can do with it besides equivalence relations. That value numbering is, is, is discovering global equivalence relations is basically what it does. It, it, I believe it would make it equivalent to PDE, the flow-based PDE algorithms, or, or supersede actually, is, is C2's, the standard constant propagator is not, with ideal calls, is not equivalent to PDE. Um, there's some things one gets, the other does not. In practice, I'm running lots of tests back when I was at grad school, so a long time ago, um, it was strongly superior in terms of what it discovered and how well it did it, but it's not equivalent. I think with the, the PhD thesis work on global equivalence, it will become equivalent. Or it, it'll become strictly monotonic superior. It'll find everything PD does plus more, I think. Having said that, don't know. Cool. I, I, I got a, a lot of things learned today. <laughs> Da, 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 yay. Well, let's, you know, here we are, 1145. Um, why don't we call it and we can revisit any of this next week if people are excited and I can talk about more on lattice theory. I, I kind of went halfway down. There's another, another half of it floating around. But then, then, then it tops out and that's the, that's the base for what I'm doing for typing in AA. Um, I haven't talked about memories and classes and stuff, and I haven't talked about transforms on lattices and lattices to join lattices to lattices to make new lattices and stuff like that. There's a couple more interesting things to wail on, but if you're excited, you're excited, and if you're not, you're not, and we can go either way here. So let's call it. And uh, it was a good, fun conversation for me. I, I, I like talking about this stuff. Of course, I'm tooting my own horn, but on the other hand, that makes me rethink all my, my assumptions and make sure I believe them myself. Um, and I'm all happy to take criticism here because I could be fucked up and I don't know it yet. <laughs> Rather find out sooner than later. So if you guys think I've got something wrong, let me know. All right, till we meet again. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Yeah, bye.